Good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, being such a lovely, large crowd. We are really excited to kick off 2024 uh, Arlington Author Salon with this event. Uh, can everybody hear me in the back? Yeah, okay, excellent. Um, so here we are, 2024. We started the series in 2015. I know, right? <laughs> so, and it is still going strong. So, um, tonight we have three authors, as we always do, uh, who, like last time, came to us um, as a preformed group, which really made our work easier, um, and with a theme and an idea, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, and uh, as you'll see, each one started off in a different field, and so that is actually going to be something that we're going to discuss at the end, which is that uh, how and why they came to writing as a new chapter in their life, not necessarily um, one and then the other, sometimes overlapping. But um, because of this topic, uh, we thought it might be of particular interest to the audience because I know there are a lot of people in the area and probably a lot in the room who might be contemplating writing as well. Uh, so we're altering our usual format by just a little bit. Uh, they will, each uh, reader or uh, author will have about more like 10 to 12 minutes instead of the usual 15, so that then we can have a uh, moderated conversation and the Q&A at the end. If you've just come in, there are some seats in the back, which I think is what people in the back were gesticulating about. Um, so hold your, please hold your questions to the, for the end, because we will have ample time for that. Uh, a couple of other items before we really get started. I want to thank, as always, our host, Emily, and the staff of the fantastic Kickstand Cafe. Uh, this cafe serves as an office for many local writers, and we're grateful for that. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to my co-organizer, Whitney Scherer, uh, who started this with me back in 2015. Huge thanks as well to um, Sarah Regan of the staff of uh, Robbins Library. Robbins Library is our partner in this, uh, and so she helps to run the salon and is critical to its success, and to the staff of ACMI for filming the event and putting together a really nice video that they post online, so we'll be sending that link around. Um, Again, there are, I think there are a couple more seats in the back. There's certainly more space. So if you want to take the moment now to wend your way over, you're welcome to do that. Um, the program, this program is funded in part by the Arlington Libraries Foundation. And so tonight's event is sponsored in part by them. The Arlington Libraries Foundation is the primary fundraiser for Robbins and Fox Branch Libraries and is dedicated to helping open the doors to all those who are curious creating an inclusive space for the Arlington community and ensuring the library's future as the cornerstone of the community for generations to come. Uh, so we are grateful for their support. Uh, books will be for sale because we believe in authors making money from their books. So uh, big thanks to the Book Rack and Mike over there, um, owner and manager of the Book Rack, who will be selling books. So please, at the end, make your way over there, support the authors, buy some books, get them signed, um, have your selfie taken <laughs> with, with the authors. We, we all love that kind of stuff. Um, so I think that's it. Please make sure your phones are on silent and not going to make doody doo sounds in the middle. Uh, and there we go. So our first author is Grace Dane Mazur, and she is the author of Hinges, Meditations on the Portal of Imagination, Trespass, a novel, Silk, Stories, and The Garden Party, which I believe is the book that is here for sale, another novel. After studying painting at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, she started again at Harvard, where she received her BA and PhD. There she spent a decade or so immersed in, wait for it, silk moths and their microarchitecture before leaping out of biology for fiction. Most recently on the fiction faculty of the MFA program for writers at Warren Wilson, she has also taught at Harvard Extension School and Emerson. So please join me in welcoming Grace. So 
how wonderful to be here. I didn't know about these events, and I'm, I'm uh, just stunned. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'm going to read a little bit from the Garden Party. Uh, it's a novel. It takes place in Brookline, Massachusetts in 1991. Uh, the reason for that is I wanted no cell phones. When people got isolated, I wanted them to be really isolated at the ends of the world. Anyway, it's the night before the wedding, the rehearsal dinner. It's a weird dinner party. The groom's family, the Coens, are academics, artists, and activists. They've invited the Barlows, a family consisting almost entirely of lawyers, for dinner in the garden. The two families don't really know each other. They're wary, shy, verging on dislike. While the bride's family, the Barlows, are arriving, the groom is still naked up in his room. One of his sisters is locked in her room, trying to figure out what on earth to wear, and the other one is perched high up on the slate roof of the Victorian house, observing. The bride, who arrived early, has run up to the pond in tears with the dog. The groom's father, Pindar Cohen, realizes that he would rather his son marry an oak tree than the Barlow girl. And the groom's mother, Celia Cohen, wonders why everyone around her is nuts. Two dozen people, all of them wishing to be somewhere else, and we're in everybody's head. Don't worry, the book has a seating plan. <laughs> I needed it to write the book, and people need it to read the book. We're in everybody's head as we watch up and down the length of the table. New, forbidden unions are forming while old unions dissolve. The host of the garden party, the father of the groom, is Pindar Cohen. He's an old-fashioned scholar of ancient Babylonian cooking recipes, the oldest one dating from 3,700 3, years ago. He's seated next to a woman he really can't stand, the mother of the bride, Philippa Barlow. She's an estate lawyer. Don't be afraid that I really come down hard on all the lawyers. I get very friendly to them <laughs> later on. I was advised that I was doing that former thing, and then I, I paid a lot of attention to the lawyers, and I got into their heads, and then the book became lawyer heavy, so I moved back. Anyway, we're going to hear some of Pindar Cohen's thoughts that get quite abstract, and forgive me for that, but it has to do with my, uh, my show and tell, which I'm warning you now is one piece of baklava and one piece of kataifi, and you'll see why. And the reason I brought them is, You'll get to think about them both as sensory objects and as models of a sort. Anyway, here we go. Pindar saw that he had to figure everything out right then while Philippa was speaking to him. For what if, what if death came and grabbed his arm instead of Philippa Barlow? Shanghaied him and pulled him away to where he would no longer be capable of doing his work. Dread flowed through him, making each vein a thoroughfare of consciousness. The bats darting overhead no longer looked like helpful and comical fruit eaters. They were dark little ideas, too quick to catch. He wanted to throw something at them. He saw, too, that he couldn't jettison his conversation with Philippa, sitting there beside him only because of the upcoming marriage of their offspring. He could not even slight her, but would have to concentrate on her as well as on the thing that mattered, the nature of time. This other activity would have to remain invisible to Philippa, to everyone. He would have to pay attention to everything, even the dinner party, which, with its snorts and wheezing and sudden laughter, reminded him of the sounds a sea serpent might make 
when surfacing in a warm ocean, its head over there, ready to jump into the unknown upper world and grasp and comprehend the universe, its tail over there where the young children were sitting, ready to follow wherever the four parts might lead, leaving in the end its wake traveling behind. Do you think that my father is flirting with your mother, broke in Philippa. Excuse me, said Pindar. The old ones, flirting. Oh, said Pindar, as though he had not noticed this. He realized that he'd been thinking of his conversation with Philippa as an interruption. But that would only be true if time were linear, a single line with a unique direction, which was absurd. The arrow wasn't even the proper shape of distance. We tend, he thought, to consider distance as though we had nothing but a yardstick or a string and a stone to measure it with. But we experience it as some sort of sprouting and folding and buckling. When we distill it to a single dimension in order to describe it by measurement, we lose the whole richness and feeling of distance. He looked now in the direction of Philippa's gesture. Oh, he said again, our parents. Do you think so? Pindar turned his thoughts back to time. What exactly was a moment? Was it the shortest span of time that could be represented by art? Perhaps moments were like sheets of gold leaf, hammered ever so thin, each leaf the locus for new thoughts. Time would then be a matter of lay layering so that each second had a stack of moments on top, a baklava of time. Was this why his new Babylonian fragment had the word layers and then a gap where a piece was chipped out and then time? Or was that word branches rather than layers? Perhaps time wasn't flat after all. In that case, no sheaves like baklava, but filaments like kataifi, those nests made of shredded pastry drenched with syrup or honey. <clears throat> he saw the pastry threads as silver now, each strand branching into new trees of silvery time growing out from each second, all of them inhabited by breath. For breathing had become necessary to his conception of time inspiration and expiration. He needed the gods to breathe into him, breathe through him like a flute. And a bit later, his old thought demons approached now, trying to lure him away with reason. This was not rational, they said, to picture crucial things like time in terms of honey-soaked Middle Eastern pastries. It was foolish to seek illumination in the middle of a dinner party. He was supposed to get his son, Adam, married. Be reasonable, his demons said. Work for communal blessing and put off this selfish and dicey search until the guests are gone, your desk is clean, your mind uncluttered, and your memory clear. But what if he should die? That was the flaming weapon he shook at the demons he called holding back and sloth. They always came in pairs or quartets, his demons. He could almost see them. They had multiple wings and bore the heads of men and oxen, eagles and lions. They told him he should not expect to figure out anything during a party. Revelation, he replied now, was never an act of reason. At this, they bowed slightly, all four of them, linked at the tips of their wings. Then, twisting like smoke, they backed away. So Pindar would do it now. He would slip seconds made of lapis lazuli among the beaten golden sheets of time. He would do it while sitting next to Philippa Barlow, listening to her talk about refrigerators, about ping pong and tennis and vacuum cleaners. And if he got anywhere, if he untangled any of the knots, then he would always link his findings with Philippa, 
simply because she had been at his side when he did this, due to the conjugal patterns of this gathering. And by being there then, she would achieve and deserve a place in his mind, a bit horrible, but necessary. And he would have to feel for her a sort of love. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. That was wonderful. So much great imagery. Thank you. Um, I have questions, but I'm going to hold them, of course. So uh, our second author is Leslie Bannatine, who received, <laughs> go for it. You can clap. Um, received the 2018 Bosque Literary Journal Fiction Prize, the 2019 Tucson Festival of Books Literary Award, and the GhostStory.com 2020 Summer Fiction Prize. She's had work in the Boston Globe, uh, Smithsonian, and the Christian Science Monitor, as well as many literary magazines. And her debut collection of short stories, Unaccustomed to Grace, which is kind of funny because we just had a Grace reading, uh, was published by Callisto Gaia Press in 2022. Uh, as a freelance journalist, Leslie has covered stories ranging from Druids in Massachusetts to relief workers in Bolivia. She writes extensively on popular culture, and her most recent nonfiction book, Halloween Nation, was shortlisted for Bram Stoker Award. So welcome, Leslie. Thank you. Okay, this is fine. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna read from the very beginning of a story in Unaccustomed to Grace, and it's, um, I tried to write a love story. And so it's the story of Jack and Suzanne, and they start out here and they end up there, and that's not you know, giving anything away. It's a love story, and it's called The Patron Saint of Bachelors and Toothaches. Suzanne, <clears throat> draw 12 cards. The blonde is late. Oh, let me just say, the, the sage can go out. <laughs> My sensory item is sage. People can take one? Yes. Yeah, people can take one. Suzanne, draw 12 cards. The blonde is late, and now she's whining about traffic. So I put on my wise Indian face and hold up my hand to signal her to shut up. She draws the cards. Empress, I say, and tap a shiny blue nail forefinger on the one at the top of the spread. Mama hates that I work my tarot business out of the garage, but I pay rent, so really? I decorated it with fake New Mexico-looking blankets and glued beads and feathers on the bottom of the lampshades. I painted the side door the bright blue and orange you see in pictures of Santa Fe, and no one has ever asked why a half Sioux who's never been to a powwow, not even a new age one, would do that. If they ask, I tell them I saw it in a vision. But people are uncurious. They only want to hear about themselves. I already know what this lady wants. I can smell it on her. She's got a husband with a locked phone and a lot of new shirts, and she wants to know if she's still in the game. People come to fortune tellers for the same reason they hire private detectives. Most of the time, they don't want the true answer. I do. Since I was born, I've wanted a baby. Since I was a teenager, I've been looking for the right guy to have it with. It's a spiritual thing. I know in my soul that my child will change the world. My question is simple, where is that guy? When I was 20, an Italian psychic who said she was related to Leonardo da Vinci cupped her hand over my heart and said, feel that? And I felt a ping. Not some angelly hot flash, but more like someone flicking an elastic band at my heart. And she said, when you meet your soulmate, that's what you'll feel. He cares about you, I tell the blonde, after I've given her a rundown of her other cards, which have more to do with her work and her mother and her stomach. Give him time. The Empress is about potential, gestation. There will be a change in him within the month. He'll tell you everything. 
This urge to finish a story is strong in people. She sighs as if she's been holding her breath for the whole 45 minutes of the reading. I light a sage stitch gesture for her to stand. She does dutifully, arms locked to her side, eyes closed. I draw figure eights in the air with the smoke and hum a tune that sounds vaguely Native American. I saw this sage thing in a movie about Mexico City. People love it. The blonde's fingers tremble as she lays 320s, a 10, and a 5 on the table between us, then another 20, a tip. You drop this, I say, holding the Macy's card I pinched from her purse when she hung up her sweater. <laughs> I could never be harsh in the presence of generosity. Jack. The wolves are agitated. They smell rain. The alpha lifts her nose to taste the wind, sussing out movement, smell, humidity, light. Her head swivels, and I feel two beads of fire-lit amber lock on me. I'm low, only feet away, dead rabbit in my fist. A hawk has been circling above, dropping altitude with each pass, rabbit in its sights. I pitch the rabbit low toward the alpha. She flies. 120 pounds of buff lightning snags it, locks it under her front paws. The enraged hawk banks upward. What's he eating, mommy? I see a little girl, maybe six, watching through the zoo's exterior fence. It's a she, and she's having her lunch, I say, squatting down to the kid's height. It's a rabbit. The mom gives me a filthy look. Hey, it's a zoo. What do you think we feed them? I soften my tone. We like to give them food they'd have in the wild. That way, when we release them out in Arizona, they'll know what to eat. We need to stop the wolves forgetting who they are. The kid looks at me with her brows knit up in a squiggle, but I'm not sure which word she doesn't get. Wild, release, Arizona. Did it kill the bunny? No, the bunny was already dead. I try to smile at mom, but she avoids my eyes. People donate roadkill all the time, I tell her in a confidential tone. I thought mom would soften. I'm wrong again. Let's go see the ducks, she chirps. The girl allows herself to be let off, but she looks back at me every two steps. I wish I'd kept my mouth shut. I've got only 30 more days of community service, and I already have two strikes. The first, I let the hyacinth macaw in the children's zoo nearly bite a woman's finger in two. Homeschool mom type wanted to show her kid how to feed the bird, and I did let her get too close. My fault. Second, pulling a two-inch nail out of the hoof of a Himalayan goat with the grab end, of, grab end of a hammer. But how was I supposed to know that's not how it's done? You've got to use better judgment, Darla warned me after the macaw thing. I know, boss, I said. Would you like some stranger sticking their fingers in your face? Think of it from the animal's point of view. Darla wasn't talking about the stupid bird. She was talking about the deer. Everyone's always bringing up the deer. And every time, every goddamn time, my stomach does flip-flops, and I'm back in my mind with Benny and Joe on Benny's 28th birthday. We're out of our minds drunk, and Benny decides we need to shoot arrows into Spot Pond to see who can send them the furthest. But it's after 1 in the morning, and we can't see a damn thing because it's so dark. And Joe comes up with a brilliant idea that we should go bow hunting and Benny gets this maniac look and points to the zoo, and before I know it, we're climbing the fence to the deer enclosure, and Joe gets an arrow off that nails one, and it's running around the edges of the pen, and we're all hollering, and it keeps throwing itself against the fence, and they keep shooting off arrows, and the deer's hooves are sparking on the rocks, and then it crumbles, and I'm paralyzed, convinced that the dying deer is looking me in the eye, and I can feel everything, it feels, and I fall on the ground, and I cry, and I hear Benny yelling, you're such a wuss, Jack. Five years probation, 1,200 hours community service with animals. Suzanne, I wave goodbye to the frizzy blonde and breathe in the lilac. It's spring, and the earth's shooting out yellow everywhere, and there's that headachey, sweet smell of wet bark mulch. It starts to rain, and a wind kicks twigs against the garage. 
My legs itch like there are a thousand flies in my bones, so I decide to go to a run and burn off some of the buzz. I head toward the pond, concentrating on the even slap, slap, slap of my sneakers on wet pavement, the sound of my breath past donkeys across Montvale Ave, through the puddles on the dirt path along the water, my braid flogging my back. The pond is agitated. A wet wind chops the surface. I sit on a big rock for a minute, and something in me wakes. A low sound that starts deep and swells until it reaches my throat and pries open my mouth. It's a love song. Mama taught me when I was a kid. I never understood the woods, but I sang it out my bedroom window on summer nights, hoping for some stranger boy to hear me and come by. Tans no wahuke, waki ya nke. After, I feel better. Thanks, I whisper to the water. I run back towards my garage, and about a half a mile in, I find a baby mobile someone dropped. I rinse it off in a puddle and bring it home to add to my things for the baby collection, which fills nearly half the garage. I am that sure I will have a kid. The Italian psychic was four years ago. Four years and no ping. Every time I get anxious waiting for my real life to start, I repeat my mantra, patience and gestation. The Empress is my favorite card, Jack. A quiet wail is coming from the pond, a song. The world slows like someone grabbed a hold of it and stopped its spin for just a second, then let it go again. I climb on top of the feed shed to see if I can find the source of the sound. A wet snort in the capiera bend, fluttering of wings on water, frantic chatter from the lemurs, Bleats, whistles, grunts, flaps, all rising in a demand for food, company, peace, territory. The now, now, now of animals. All I see is a woman jogging along the shore. I'll stop there. Thank you, Leslie. Oops. to go back up for our next reader. Um, OK, our third presenter is Hank Philippi Ryan. She is the USA Today bestselling author of 15 novels of suspense. She's also won multiple prestigious awards for her crime fiction, including five Agathas, five Anthonys, and the coveted Mary Higgins Clark Award. You might also recognize her as the on-air investigative reporter for Boston's WHDH-TV. And she has won 37 Emmys, 14 Edward R. Murrow Awards, and dozens of other honors for her groundbreaking journalism. National Book Reviews have called Hank a superb and gifted storyteller. Her novels have been named Best Thrillers of the Year by Library Journal, New York Post, Real Simple Magazine, and many others. Her current book, which is now in its second printing, is the cat and mouse thriller, The House Guest, which is over there. Hank lives in Boston with her husband, a renowned criminal defense and civil rights attorney. Please welcome Hank. So my book, The House Guest, is a thriller. That means I cannot tell you what it's about. <laughs> but it is a twisty, turny series of mind games. Twisty, so that's why we have Twizzlers. 
<laughs> there are also luggage tags because, you know, the house guest. Um, if you don't get a luggage tag, I have more. Don't worry about it. There are many. So there was a question on Twitter at one point that said, can you describe your book in five words? Which I thought, sure, I can do that. And then it turned out to be not that easy. But for the house guest, I came up with the words greed, betrayal, divorce, female empowerment, I made that one word, and, <laughs> and revenge. Greed, divorce, betrayal, female empowerment, and revenge. So the house guest is two smart women facing off in a high-stakes psychological cat and mouse game to prove their truth about a devastating betrayal. But which character is the cat and which character is the mouse? And here in chapter one is where they meet. Alyssa swirled the olives in her martini, thinking about division. She stared through her chilled glass to the mirrored shelves of multicolored bottles in front of her at the hotel bar. Division, as in divorce. Not only the physical division, hers from Bill, but what would happen after the lawyers finished? They'd already created a ledger of their lives together and then started the McCallan's financial division, which would be followed by the devastating subtraction. Bill had subtracted her from his life. That was easy math. With a lift of his chin and a slam of the front door and a squeal of Mercedes tires, she'd asked him why he was leaving her, begged to know, yearned to understand. But Bill McKellen always got what he wanted, no explanation offered or obligatory. She had done nothing wrong, zero. That's what baffled her, terrified her. She jiggled the fragments of disappearing ice, Division, the Weston House, the Osterville Cottage, the jewelry, her jewelry, the first editions, the important paintings, club membership, the silver money, the lawyers, human calculators who cared nothing about her would discuss and divide, and then Bill would win. Bill always won. All she'd done for the past eight years was addition She'd added to their lives, added to their social sphere, organizing and planning to be Bill's wife, fulfilling her job to make him comfortable and enviable and the image of benevolent success. She more than accepted it. She'd embraced it and all that came with it. And then this. I need a break, he'd told her that day. She pictured that moment now, a month ago. She could almost smell him, a seductive mix mixture of leathery orange-green aftershave and his perennial power. Bill, talking down to her, literally and figuratively, wearing one of his pale blue shirts, expensive yellow tie, loose and careless, khaki pants and loafers. A break. As if, his, as if his life with her was a video he could put on pause while he did more important things. What things? The music from the speakers in each corner of their Vermilion Hotel's earnestly chic, dark paneled bar floated down over her some unrecognizable tune, all piano and promises, muffling conversations and filling the silence. A couple sat on one end of the bar, knee to knee, on vacation on business, clandestine, impossible to tell. At the other end, a sport-coated man, Ty Askew, used one finger to find the mar maraschino cherry in his brown drink. He popped it into his mouth and licked his fingers before he went back to scrolling his phone. Alyssa was in the middle, alone. She drew in a deep breath, all peaty scotch and lemons and strangers and elusive perfume, alone. Alyssa felt her shoulders sag, assessing the other parts of her life grouped on Bill's side of the ledger. She understood he did. It was difficult when a couple split. Social allegiances were tested, loyalties strained. She jabbed at the closest green olive with a little plastic stick. But Bill had taken the friends, every single one of them. And now, at the club, at the gym, at the mall, Alyssa only got pitying glances fingertip hidden whispers, as if they, in their hothouse world of affluence and connection, understood something she didn't. When she and Bill first met that night at the charity event, they both had big plans. Now, only he had them. 
When she wasn't Bill's wife anymore, who would she be? And did she have the power to change that? Her phone lay on the zinc bar, its glowing screen taunting her with the proof. No matter how many times she looked at it, her calendar messaged her new reality. You have no events. No events. Only blank days, one after the other, calendared out in front of her. She scrolled back through her past, the listings grayed out now, ghosts of occasions, charity balls, gala dinners, speeches by successful entrepreneurs, and a fundraiser where they'd auctioned off a day with Bill McAllen. That went for thousands. Everyone loved Bill. And somehow, calculating again, Alyssa was the plus one. Now, in the excruciating math of marriage, addition, division, she was the minus. Nothing changed for him. Bill was always jetting off to New York or Chicago or someplace exotic. She reached into that shoulder bag hanging from the curved back of her bar stool, slid her hand into a side pocket, and pulled out a postcard showing palm trees like they used to see in St. Bart's. Bill, she knew it was Bill, had sent the unsigned postcards, pictures of tropical flowers and cobalt skies, simply to provide his own manipulative entertainment. Here's where you aren't. He was taunting her, distant and nasty and gloating. Here's where you will never be again. Here in Weston, where she was, she had slush. Spring in Massachusetts. Her husband, 15 years older, was off having fun. That didn't seem fair. May I get you another? The bartender, high cheekbones and multi-pierced ear, paused in front of her, wiping out a champagne flute with a blue striped towel. She looked at her watch, pretending. Oh no, she said, how did it get to be so late? Everyone will be expecting me. Ah, uh, the bartender held up the flute to a row of tiny lights twinkling above them. Of course, if you're sure. Alyssa watched as he checked the glass for spots, then turning away from her, slid it into place on a thin wooden rack. She stared at the pale place on her finger where for eight years, three months, and 27 days, her wedding ring had been. A piece of jewelry the universe prescribes to indicate one is married and happy and off limits. There was no piece of jewelry there was no piece of jewelry denoting sorrow or confusion or disequilibrium or fear. Now her once welcoming house was empty, and when the lights got dark and long, the nights got dark and long, it terrified her. She knew Bill was lurking, watching, waiting. Bill was present in every shadow, in every noise. She hated being alone in that house hated it. She'd rather be in a random bar alone by herself than in that house. Maybe she'd simply drive around forever. Just the check, she said to the bartender. But it's early. The voice beside her, inquiring, hesitant, startled her. She hadn't noticed anyone walking up behind her, and Alyssa was not here to find companionship or conversation. In fact, the last thing she wanted was to talk to anyone. What would she even say? Even the simplest of questions, how are you, could send her to tears. The newcomer's fingernails were bitten and nubby, and her pilling sweater just the wrong shade of blue and uneven across her shoulders. She slung a raveled Kansas to canvas tote bag over the back of her stool. Her curly, wild hairstyle had been an unfortunate decision, as was her hair's artificially not quite auburn color. But that was unfairly judgmental. And the world wasn't all about Alyssa Westland McCallan. It felt like it was now, but this woman was proof it wasn't. <laughs> Thank you so much, all three of you. Um, whoop, excuse me, I'm not dancing. This is not pole dancing. This is trying to untangle myself here. Um, so what we are going to do now is to have a conversation 
Uh, so yeah, if Whitney would add a couple of chairs. And then do you three want to, should we sit? You've been standing a lot, okay. So we will sit here. I realize that in the back you might not see as well. Um, so uh, I'm gonna moderate a conversation uh, among the, the authors. And then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, when, if and when you do have a question, just signal and we'll call on you. Um, tell me your question and I will repeat it, A, so that everybody here can hear it, but also so that on the recording people can hear the question. Um, so do I, yeah, I'll take a chair too, otherwise it feels awkward to stand here. And um, we'll pass the mic around, okay, when we have questions. You can sit wherever, that's fine. I can be at an end. Okay, okay, here, we're good. Okay, excellent. Come and join us. Don't trip. All right, perfect. Great, so, okay, those were amazing, fantastic, fun, and very different readings. Uh, you all three have had previous careers, uh, and sometimes the careers have overlapped with writing, but this is perhaps an obvious question, but one that I think many people are wondering, what inspired the change, or what inspired you to kind of turn that corner and go ahead and write a book, several books, 15 books? Um, so I'll pass the mic around, I'll let you decide who's gonna answer first. Me? Yes. Oh. There you are, you've got the mic. Okay. Um, well, first I went to art school. And the reason I went to art school was because at 17, I had just been kicked out of college and I had made some telephone calls to my boyfriend who was giving lectures in Czechoslovakia and my parents uh, kind of urged me to get a job. So I got a job at the Museum of Fine Arts and that was fantastic for a teenager. Every lunch hour, the museum was mine. And one of the things I realized was that not only was I a hopelessly uh, illogical <laughs> adolescent, but even worse, my eye was not trained. And I decided at that point uh, that I would go to the museum school and I knew they couldn't teach me to draw or probably even to paint, but I was quite sure they could teach me to sit still and look at things. And I did, I did, I did that, stayed there for three years and then realized there's a whole world out there and I started again as a freshman at Harvard in biology because this was the mid to late 1960s. DNA, the structure of DNA had been discovered the previous decade and biology was hopping. So I stayed all the way through in biology and I was among these incredible silkworms that looked like jade moving. And I thought I would stay there forever, but I was reading a book in uh, the History of Science called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn and not understanding it. And the book describes the shift in modern physics from the physics of Newton to the physics of Einstein. And I could understand that much, but I wasn't getting it in my gut. So I cast around for what is, what's really going on here? Well. It's a whole profession changing its mind. What goes on when we change our minds? I had no idea. But I'd been through art school. I'd been through biology school. I didn't want to go to another school. So I thought, I speak English. I'll write a novel. Of course. It gets worse. <laughs> For two years, I tried to straddle biology and, and writing, and I had this uh, romantic uh, cockamamie idea that you never talk to other writers, you never go to a workshop, you never uh, look for any criticism whatsoever, you stay alone in your garret and you simply write. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then somebody showed me 
the comments on her manuscript from her advisor at uh, an MFA program, and I realized, oh my God, there's, uh, there's a whole world here that I don't know. And I can either stay in this damn garret alone and make up things from first principles, but it will take me my entire life. I better go get an MFA. And so I applied and almost by return mail was rejected. So I called them up and I said, I have a Harvard PhD in biology. On the basis of what did you reject me? <laughs> I told you it got worse. And they said, on the basis of your writing. <laughs> Go and take a workshop. So my first workshop was at Harvard Extension, and, uh, and then finally they let me into the, the MFA program uh, at Warren Wilson in North Carolina, and that was marvelous. And finally I got to go back and teach there. But that switch into writing was really because I didn't understand something and I wanted to, to look at it maybe in another way. Uh, how do we change our minds? So that, that first novel was, it's in the back of my closet. <laughs> um, yeah. It's the first pancake that you throw to the dogs. Yeah. <laughs> I had spent 30 years looking at folklore and popular culture and the history of holidays, mostly Halloween. And uh, Previous to that, I had written everything from obituaries to advertising. I wrote about batteries and tube socks. Uh, I wrote articles on the mud on baseball and why Frodo's cape is covered with cornstarch to make it look like snow. Everything I did was nonfiction. It was all had to be sourced, footnoted, verified. And I, for some for no reason, took a class at Harvard Extension called The Beginning Short Story. And I was in the classroom terrified because everyone was about 20 years younger than me. Um, this is maybe 15 years ago. And they all looked smart and energetic and full of life. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm in the wrong place. But when I did the first assignment, I, it dawned on me, I mean, this is very basic and simple, but you can make this stuff up. <laughs> and you didn't have to footnote it or get three people to agree it was true. And I, it was like finding a room in my house that I didn't know was there. And so I've done nothing since then. <laughs> but that. <laughs> We should talk about that making stuff up part. That's, that's really important. I think it's really important. It's so funny because ever since I was a little girl, I had wanted to do something that would change the world, that would leave a mark, that would make a difference, that would sort of have it matter that I lived. So when I got out of college and I got on my change the world kick, I went into politics. I hesitate to tell you this. And I worked for several pol political campaigns back home in Indiana. Um, sadly, no candidate I ever worked for actually won. <laughs> and that is when the universe is telling you, find another career. So this was 1970. And I went, I decided I would change, I would change the world by being a reporter. So I went to the biggest radio station in Indianapolis, and remember again, 1970, went to the biggest radio station in Indianapolis, and I said, I'm here to apply for a job as a reporter. And the news director said, well, that's great. Um, we do need a reporter. Where was your last radio reporting job? So I, I'm an English major, you know, this, I have nothing. So I said, well, no, no, I've never been a radio reporter. And he says, that's okay, television, no. Magazines, no. Newspapers, no. He says, have you ever written anything? And I said, no. And he said, did you go to journalism school? No. He says, were, were you on the school paper? No, he said, when you were a little girl, did you hand out mimeograph newspapers door to door? And you're, no, you know, no, I didn't do that. I was a Shakespeare major, I was reading. So he finally says, you know, you seem like a very nice young woman, and I probably could teach you how to be a reporter, but I don't have time. 
He said, besides, you're supremely unqualified for this job. He said, can you give me one good reason why I should hire you? And I said, well, yes, I can. I said, your license is up for renewal at the Federal Communications Commission right now, and you don't have any women working here. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, then I just smiled, and the next day I had my first job <laughs> in broadcasting. <laughs> I mean, it is interesting, and we should talk about this. Jane Pauley calls us the class of 1970. Those of us who started in any part of the commercial world in the 70s were, did have to work harder and be better and be tougher and be a little brazen and a little brave and a little confident about that. So I've been a reporter every day since then. I've been a reporter for 43 years. And one day, about 16 years ago, I was 55, I had a really good idea for a book. And I came home and I said to my husband, sweetheart, I've got a great idea for a novel. I'm going to write a book. And Jonathan says, great, honey. He says, do you know how to write a book? And I said, and I remember it so well, I said, how hard can it be? You know, <laughs> I've read a million books. Um, and I soon learned how hard it could be. But um, that journey of confidence, you know, that crazy, audacious idea that you could write a book, and I think that's what we were all talking about, is really a big step. Wow, those are, those are three incredible stories, actually, of how you came to this. And they, but they have a few things in common. They have um, intellectual curiosity, serendipity, and chutzpah, among, among other things. Um, so those are great to hear. And I think, uh, um, I mean, I had, my next question was gonna be, you've kind of already answered it through this, is you know, what, what made you think that you could write a book? Um, but you know, I think for all of those writers who are here, until you've written a book, you think you can write a book. It's not until after you've written the book that you realize maybe you couldn't write a book. <laughs> so um, are there subjects or characters or settings or uh, specific elements that you put into your books that you feel that you could not have done uh, if you had started into a writing career much earlier in life? Yeah, we'll start somewhere else. We'll start. We'll go. We'll go backwards now. I think that's such an important question, because one of the things I've learned as a reporter and as a writer is that you can't do anything quickly. It it takes a long time. You can't tesser into writing a book. And I would never, ever have been able to write the books I have without my 40-some years of experience as a reporter. And I can tell you specifically why. What is a good story is the same whether it's fiction or nonfiction, exactly as you were talking about, Leslie. You need a character that you care about, an important problem that needs to be solved. You track down clues and follow leads, and in the end, you want, to, you want the good guys to win and the bad guys to get what's coming to them, and you want some justice, and you want to change the world a little bit, and you want to change people's lives. And whether it's investigative reporting or whether it's writing fiction, um, it's the same thing. You want the world to be different for the readers or the viewers. In writing suspense, you know, in television, I don't want you to change the channel when my stories are on. It's so easy to go click, nope, 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 nope. I'm not going to watch that anymore. And so I don't want you to put my books down either. It's that same pacing, that same rhythm. I want you to miss your stop on the T. Remember when there was a T? I want you to <laughs> miss your stop on the T. <laughs> yeah. I want you to miss your stop on the T. So that rhythm, that pacing, and the, and the answer to the question, why do I care? is so prevalent in both nonfiction and in fiction. And I learned that as a reporter. Did you too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. You're, so, you're very right. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that it not, yes, I will say something different. The, um, the view you have at 70 is different from the view you have at 40 or 50 or maybe even 60. Not only is there so much more material, you've met some more, many more people, done so many things, you've got all this stuff to work with, 
But also, in a different vein, the process is different because now with all these decades behind me, I have more patience that if I'm working on something and it's not coming, it will come. I know it will. It has before. It has enough times before that I know that, that will, it will come. The character will speak. The setting will change. It will work. And I also have learned over a lot of years to recognize when there's energy in a story, be it fiction or nonfiction, you see the energy, you feel the energy. And that's something I couldn't have done a couple of decades ago, I think. I know when it's alive and when it's not alive. And, and also, the last thing is it's fine to get criticism. I don't think I was like that a couple, you know, even a decade or two ago. But criticism is a good thing. And um, I have learned that as well after much experience with criticism. Before we get to Grace, I, I want to just comment on this for, some, for, for one second. Your, your, your idea of the process is so perfect and the fear and the panic. And one of my new mantras as, as a writer is that I say embrace the panic, dance in the storm, because I have learned after all these years that Right when the panic comes, when I think, oh, I didn't ask the right question, the story is not working, the, the people are not talking to me. Every time I hit that wall, soon after the answer will come, that's the moment that signals you're going to get this, it's just going to take a minute. So now when I panic or worry or have this pang of fear, I think, yay, this is the panic, because the answer will come soon. Yeah. I certainly agree with, with both of you and, and wouldn't know better than to just repeat it, but one thing I would add is that when I was much younger, I wasn't ready to look at humans. I loved looking at silk moths and caterpillars and thought, ooh, humans, they're so messy. <laughs> and. And people, when I was going into biology from art school, the first thing people asked me was, are you going to become a biological illustrator? Well, no. As I told you, they didn't teach me to draw. Um, and I wanted to do very basic biology with uh, molecules. And I wanted nothing bigger than insects. And, but people said, are you going to become a doctor? No, because there again, you had to deal with humans. <laughs> Now, looking at humans, for one thing, when I was in biology, I had to be dark adapted. So, because I was spending most of my time on the electron microscope, and the screen there, at least in the old days, was very dim. So you had to stay dark adapted all day long. And if I went out into the corridors, I would kind of scuttle like a crab, keeping away from the windows. And I knew if ever I was outside, I was playing hooky. And now, as a writer, I can go outside and watch people, and it's just the most amazing thing. It's, it's where it's at. <laughs> well, before, before we open it up to questions, um, I have one last question, which is, uh, do any of you have any advice for any of these humans in the, in the light um, who might be contemplating writing or maybe have begun a project? And, um, yeah, that, I guess that's the question. Any, any kind of words of advice? And then we'll open it up to questions. There's nothing harder. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, there's nothing more exciting. When I first started writing, and I was still basically a biologist, I couldn't sit down at my desk because I was kind of dancing and whirling around the room just at the pleasure of playing with words for hours. That just gives me chills. Uh, and it's so hard. And I love it even when I rip up more than I write during a day. That may be why I'm one of the slowest, I'm the slowest writer I know. <laughs> yeah. 
I would say um, it's, it's something you do alone, but you are not alone, which is something that I've learned. When, when you write, you have all the books you've ever read in your head. It's, it's not like you're out there on the ocean on a raft with a coconut. You've got a lot behind you. And there are also people around you, or I have found great people to read drafts of what I've written and to give comments. And that there's a whole community that's out there to support young writers, new writers, emerging writers. So it's not a lonely thing. You are alone. But it's not a lonely thing. I think we're used. I think we're used to school, where you get an assignment and you write the thing, and then you turn it in, and someone says bad or good, and it's done and over. Writing a novel or a short story for your joy and for your passion and for your pleasure isn't like school. It's a process. No one ever has to look at it until you want them to. And every day the story, the story changes, and every day your mind changes, and every day your character changes. You can't fix a blank page, but you can fix something that you've written. So when in doubt, it's hard, as Grace says, but it's, it's hard. Just go on. There'll be days that you're happy and joyous and the, and the muse is speaking to you and the words are coming and they're coming out of your fingers so quickly that you can't even believe that you wrote them. And you'll look at them later and think, I wrote that? Oh, that's not bad. And there are other days that I'm like, the, no, <laughs> she, delete. And you can't think of anything. But just keep going. There are days, I'll tell you this so quickly, there are days when I look at my words and I think, that is the worst sentence that anyone has ever written in the history of the planet. And then I think, OK, that's, yep, you're right, sister. Just go on and write one more bad sentence, and another bad sentence, and another bad sentence. Because eventually it will come. Because the muse only comes when you're working. And if, and if you give up, she's not there. The muse only comes when you're working. If you're not working, she gets into a pout. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. OK, so we're going to take some questions. And remember, I'm just going to repeat them um, and then have, the, have these lovely panelists, authors answer. So who wants to throw out the first question? OK, go ahead. Okay, so the question is from somebody who's a copy editor, been a copy editor for quite a while, uh, working on a first book, a novel, yeah, and has read Stephen King's uh, book on craft, on writing, which is excellent, highly recommend it. Uh, and in that book, he recommends writing the first draft in, what was the phrase? With the door closed. Um, this is if you're lucky enough to have a door to close. Anyhow, um, so uh, the question is, what do you think of that advice? You know, should I be showing my work or should I get through the whole first draft with that door closed? It doesn't have to be you. <laughs> um, I, I, I love that book. On, first of all, bless you for being a copy editor. You're a joy and a glory and we need you. That's fantastic. <laughs> uh, I love Stephen King's on writing. It's in, inspirational and fabulous. Bird by Bird as well as something else I'm sure you've read. Writing with the door closed, I wonder if that might mean, don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it. We all spend so much time thinking, should I do this? Should I do that? Is there a thing? If I only knew the thing that other people know, then I wouldn't be like this. No, no, there's nobody knows anything. <laughs> and nobody knows what works. What's that Somerset mom thing about there are three rules for writing a bestseller, but no one knows what they are. <laughs> 
and that's funny, but it's true. It's really true. My, my goal in writing a first draft, and I have a, a yellow sticky on my computer that says this, it says advance the story, advance the story, advance the story, just keep going. The first draft was going to be terrible if I have showed my first draft to anyone, it would be like the ravings of a lunatic. Because I'm just trying stuff out, I'm just seeing. So when you write a first draft is just the writer seeing what the story is, you're in search of the story. You don't know what it is until you write it. So you're impatient. You want to see if it's good. It doesn't matter at this point. See what the story is. Then you, know, you can go back and, and make it better. So just don't worry. Does that help at all? No, okay. I think that's, that's, a, that's perfect. Okay. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's the final answer. <laughs> OK, any other questions? Come on, there's a lot of you. Somebody has a question. There's one way in the back over there. Okay, so uh, the question is uh, from our uh, uh, audience member here who often wonders when reading books what parts are autobiographical on the author's part, if any part is. Um, she has not had yet the pleasure of reading Grace's work, but has read that of Hank and uh, Leslie and wants to know, since they have a, what did you say, macabre outlook on life, uh, which parts of their work might be autobiographical? None of the things in my stories have happened to me. No, no, I have never carried a corpse from cemetery to cemetery. <laughs> but all of them are made of tiny pieces of things I know and people I know and things I've experienced. So for me, they're very true, but the actual events have not happened to me. So they're not autobiographical, they're just made of me, if that makes any sense. <laughs> Francesca is one of the greatest, author, of, greatest editors of all times. Um, she has read five or six of my books seven or eight times, and they would not be what they are without her, thank you. Um, and so I didn't know you thought I was macabre. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm teasing, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Um, I think um, what, what, what happens in a novel is that the first book is kind of autobiographical because that's what you have, that's sort of the low-hanging fruit on the surface. And I'd been a television reporter for 30-some years at that point, and that, there's, I have some good stories. But as Leslie says, you take... It's like a Rubik's Cube. You take your experiences, a little bit from here, like a magpie, a little bit from here, a little bit from here, and ch -ch 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 can twist and polish and change and make a completely different story. So my novels are not about me, they're not about my life, but what are our books if not ourselves? We write what we know and we write who we are. And that's why, I mean, you heard the voices in all of our three readings completely different, completely recognizable, and that's because we write who we are, and that's the way it comes out. Thank you. This has given somebody time to think of a question. Yes, don't be shy. We're all friendly here. Yes. How did you three meet? Ah, how did you three meet? <laughs> Although I, sorry, I've never met Hank before, although I've read her work. I haven't read your work yet, but we have a friend in common. And uh, Leslie wrote me and asked if I would uh, be part of this amazing amalgam. <laughs> Likewise, I met Hank on email, but this is the first time we've met in person. I met Gretchen online. This is the first time we've met in person. So the answer is here. 
here. <laughs> so now this group of three is actually a group of 70 <laughs> for the next event. Uh, other questions? Yes. The question is, do any of our authors here also write poetry or experiment with poetry? I don't do it publicly, but in the summer, my husband and I write poems to each other every night after dinner and before the light goes away. event is going to be. <laughs> I do not. I'm married to a poet. <laughs> I don't. I'm married to a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions? One last one. Yeah? Uh, pantsers or planners? Ah. Pantsers or planners, for those of you who are not familiar with this, let me just explain the phrase. Among writers, there are supposedly two groups, which again, I don't really believe in categories, but there's a category of those who plan or plot their books ahead of time, and there's a category of those who fly by the seat of their pants, and they are pantsers. My first book, the one that's still in the back of the closet uh, 40 years later, um, I worked out the geometry between every two characters like a Buckminster Fuller dome. And I thought that I should make the novel the way the silk moth eggshell grows, which is first it sets up a geometry of fibers, then it expands the geometry, then it makes it more dense, and then it adds surface ornamentation, and that was going to be the final Phillips of style. <laughs> Halfway through, the character said, this is shitty. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna do what we want. Just watch, just watch. And from then on, it was like I was recording and not inventing, and I thought I was going crazy. As I said, I was in my garret, and. I hadn't read any books of what it feels like to be a writer, and I didn't know that this is what you're aiming for. Every book since, or every piece of writing since, uh, I sit down and I have very little idea of what's gonna happen, and usually, even if there's a trace of an idea, it's gone by very soon after, and that what gets, what gets me so delighted is I figure out what I'm thinking about by seeing what comes out on the page. Definitely pantser. No idea what's going to happen at the end. I would save a lot of time if I did know, because then you could write your way there. But I have no idea from scene to scene even what they're going to say and what they're going to do. Every, every, the characters, plot comes out of character for me. So there's two or three people in the room. The next thing that happens happens because of what those two or three people are doing or saying to each other. So that's how you just never know how it's going to end. I would do anything for an outline. <laughs> uh, I, w I would do anything to know how to do that. But sort of like being a television reporter, how do I know what happened until it happens? And it doesn't happen until I write it. So pants or panel here. I have no idea what, it, what even the book is about until I write the next line and the next paragraph and the next scene. And people say, oh, your books are so twisty. They're so surprising. And I'm like, yeah, could you believe that happened? Uh, you know, talk about a surprise ending. I surprise myself every time. And that's the magic of it. I mean, Sue Grafton used to call that the magic of writing, that just exactly as you were saying, the transcribing. On a good day, you're just, it, the, 
something is coming out of you that is not that is not calculated. It is just flowing through. I heard a, a wonderful interview between Lee Child and Stephen King. Can you imagine? Um, and they each describe that phenomenon, that on the good days, on the good days, it, they were not writing. They were just completely transcribing. One more fast thing about that is that George R.R. R. Martin doesn't call them plotters or pantsers. He calls them architects and gardeners because the architect makes the scaffold exactly as the silkworm does. The, the architect, may, as you can picture, the architect makes the scaffold and then puts the walls up in the drywall and then eventually puts in the wallpaper and then the couch and then the silverware. Um, a, a, a gardener has a seed of an idea, plants it, cultivates it, waters it, watches it, takes care of it, and sees what blossoms. And so either way, for, for first-time authors, Either way can work. Whatever way works for you is the way that's your way. And if your way doesn't work, try another way. There's a million ways, but there's not one way that only if you knew it, it would work. Another way of saying that is each book is as hard as the one before. <laughs> That is true. And in between the um, gardener and the architect is the landscape architect. <laughs> we have, this is my next book. This is actually what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to go from being the architect to being the gardener, but I have to stop at the landscape architecture. Uh, we have one last, I saw one hand before we end. Yes. So let's say, Oh, thank you. That is a nice ending to say that this evening is inspiring. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you to our wonderful authors. Don't get up yet. Um, this is like the teacher who says it's time for class to end and everybody like starts putting all their bags together and you can't hear what's going on. So I do want to just make sure that you all remember that there are books for sale, and I hope nobody leaves without a book. Um, and you're looking at me like, am I forgetting something? Yes, thank you. Um, the next salon actually is going to be on poetry, so we, we might need to add a fourth, a fourth person, um, which will be in, on April 4th. April is National Poetry Month. Uh, so that we, we will have some local poets. And um, what else? If you are not on our mailing list, you should be. Uh, and so uh, there's a sign up there. If you brought, came with a friend who was not on the list or something, please. Thank you, Edwige. We need a pen. I will provide a pen. You are on the list. I always put the panelists on the list. Um, so great. So thank you so much for coming. And um, the authors were happy to sign the books. Uh, and we're going to wrap it up. Thank you again to Kickstand and the staff for staying late beyond closing time. And that's it. All right. Thank you.